Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Those of you, I get to see your faces here as well as I uh, can't see your faces, but all those online, good to see you as well. Welcome. So excited to be able to dive into God's word this morning. Believe that he has something that he wants to say to each of us and what a joy it is to just to worship with you guys. And um, so we're excited as we continue our series of No Compromise in Daniel. And this morning, I think many of us can probably relate to the phrase, the writing on the wall. And for some of you, maybe you've experienced the time you're a student now, or maybe you were a student at some point, but uh, the time when you missed half of the classes, you didn't turn in all the work, and uh, you currently have an average of 40. And the final is tomorrow. The writing on the wall is you're probably going to fail. <laughs> Maybe you're a parent or you've been, um, experienced this before. You're rushing home, trying to get your kids home in time for their nap because naps are precious. You need that nap time. And you realize that your kid has fallen asleep 10 minutes ago and you're just pulling up into the house and uh, they wake up. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the writing's on the wall. Ain't <laughs> not getting a nap. <laughs> Ain't no nap time. Nope. Or maybe you're that guy that's been texting that girl. You've texted her 200 times. Come on, man. And <laughs> we don't have to say any names. <laughs> she hasn't responded. The writing is on the wall. Man, she's not interested. <laughs> I got the wrong number. No, you don't. <laughs> That's not, you don't have the wrong number. Or maybe uh, you've submitted that application to America's Got Talent, and you've received that rejection letter 50 times. My friend, the writing is on the wall. You got no talent. <laughs> you don't have any talent. But the reality is, is this morning, all of us have probably had a time in, in our life when we missed or ignored the obvious writing on the wall. Maybe we didn't want to acknowledge it. We didn't want to realize the truth. Maybe we're too prideful, too foolish, or just ignorant to reality. But either way, we just didn't get it. You know, in the same way for some of us, I think that God has been trying to get your attention. He's continually trying to get a message to you, and you dodge him. You ignore him, or you tell yourself, I don't need to listen. And I pray today that each of us will hear from God that we'd recognize his voice, and that we'd be able to be driven to trust him and to step out in our faith and obedience to what he has for us today. You know, we've been asking the question through this series, how can we live with influential conviction without compromising to culture? The idea of how do we live in this world without becoming of this world? The first few weeks, Pastor Mark focused on God's people, talking about Daniel and his friends and how they were faced with situations of compromise or they could stand firm in their convictions and God's provision when they chose to stand firm. Last week, the focus shifted as Pastor Scott looked at how culture and leadership that was in power then is really a lot like what we face today and how we should respond to that. So we continue that focus today as we look at the marks of culture driven influence compared to conviction driven influence so that we can stand firm in our convictions and not compromise. We're we'll looking at chapter five today and this chapter is about how God brought down the prideful, rebellious, unjust Babylonian empire and kept his promise to restore his people to their promised land. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, context. It's the year 539 BC. Babylon is an empire that all aspire to be, right? They're beautiful, powerful, wealthy, influential. The peak of the reign. Nearly 70 years have passed since Daniel and his friends were first brought captive to Babylon. Daniel's now an old man. He's well over 80. Nebuchadnezzar, or King Neb, or Nebi as we've called him, he's dead. He's been gone for about 23 years. So when we pick up in Daniel chapter 5, we see a gap of 23 year span from chapter 4 ending to chapter 5. We're introduced to this guy, King Belshazzar. He's King Neb's uh, entitled grandson. He's the adopted son of Nebuchadnezzar, the exiled king. And we're going to pick up reading verse 1. Right now, here we go. If you got your Bibles, jumping in. Chapter 5, King Belshazzar made a great feast 
for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. All right, so we get see right here, there's a party of all por- parties going on right here. Ns, 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 okay? It's just a, it's some good times going on. I mean, that goes on at my party. They probably didn't have synthesizers back then, but anyway. So is, but then a thousand, I don't know about you, but I don't, if I invite all my friends, I might have three people show up. Yeah, okay? But you see, you see, you got, I mean, just the party among all parties. Okay, you imagine that scene of this, and, and then this is what it says. It says, verse 2, Belshazzar went and he tasted the wine commanded that the vessels of God and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar's father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem, that they be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels, and they had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So a quick little insight here is that there wasn't a Hebrew word, not a Hebrew word for, for father. So oftentimes father was used for, for grandfather as well as father was kind of like that generic word for ancestor or predecessor. So many believe that, like I said, this is the um, grandson of King Neb. And we see that it says gold and silver vessels were taken by King Neb. We know that when he destroyed a temple, he took these vessels out, kind of like as, imagine a trophy case. Some of you, if I walked into your room or when you were a kid or whatnot, you still have that trophy when you were a peewee football. Woo, can't live that down, right? Or some of you have a lot of participation trophies. Congratulations, okay? But here's the thing is that they were kind of like putting these on display, like, look, we defeated the God of Yahweh. Like, look, he couldn't control, like, we, 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 he couldn't conquer us. We took care of conquering them. We destroyed the temple. We've got this to prove it. And they were seeing where King B decides to get this idea of, hey, it's not just good enough to have them in the trophy case, if you will. Let's bring those things out. And I got this idea. Let's drink from them. Let's drink from them because you know what? I don't care if they're holy. I don't care if they're sacred vessels, right? And not only am I going to drink from them, but while we're doing it, we're going to praise and worship these false gods, these gods of silver and gold and bronze and wood. Because I believe that in that moment, he's probably thinking, I'm above God. God, there's nothing you can do to stop me. I'm untouchable. What's interesting about this party, too, is that King B knew knew this, and so did everybody else in Babylon, that the combined armies of the Medes and the Persians were actually outside the city waiting to invade. So why in the world is he throwing this massive party? Cliffhanger, we'll come back to that later. Okay, so here we go. Verse 5, we're going to pick this up. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. Okay, in case you didn't catch that, they're at this party and fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. They're at this party. Some of them are thinking like, whoa, I have had way too much to drink. Some of them are like, this is great wine. Where'd you get this from? Because I don't know if you see what I'm seeing, but look at that cool party trick. I mean, I've never been, I don't know what kind of parties you've been to. I don't go to a lot of parties, but I've never seen that happen at a party. I've never seen that happen. So we see that we've got this mysterious floating finger. It appears, it carves a message. It's creepy, right? And it talks about the lamb stand. What's interesting about that is that would have been right above the king because the king is the center of all attention. And they, it's like dark in the room, but we're going to have a lamp stand kind of like, you know, this bright light is shining off my bald head right now that my son always reminds me of. I mean, it's like attention's on the king. So everybody would have seen this writing on the wall in this mysterious finger of God. And what's interesting is it then says in verse 6, then the king's color changed and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way and his knees knocked together. Dude, it looks like you've just seen a ghost. I mean, you know how it is when it's like he's just got that smile. He's like, everything's great. And that frown, all of a sudden that smile becomes a frown. It's like he's white, all the blood rushes out. He's weak. Why? Because he's probably thinking, what in the world is going on? Verse 7, it says, Then the king called loudly. What does he do? He does something very interesting here. 
He says, the king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they couldn't put Humpty Dump... I'm sorry. (laughs) Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. The king, Belshazzar, was greatly alarmed, and his color changed again, and his lords were perplexed. Okay, what's interesting is this, is when he's faced with this, he goes back to the well. He does the same thing he's done before, the same thing the kings have done before him. He goes who? To worldly wisdom. He goes to the world for answers. See, the king also isn't messing around. He's saying, you know what? I want to know so desperately what's going on is that I'm going to give the biggest incentive that I can give. I'm going to give royal rank, highest honor. I'm going to give power along with wealth. And here's the thing. See, what culture tells us is that you can buy happiness. Culture says you can bribe to get what you want. You can give people power, wealth. You can give them all your problems will be taken away. All you got to do is just give something. Give people what they want but not at this time. And when it talks about third in command, remember, I remember that King's B's dad still has an authority, even though he's exiled. So the principle here, when I see this, is that culture-driven influence is marked by worldly wisdom. Culture-driven influence is marked by worldly wisdom. We see this repeated theme throughout Daniel with the wise men's inability to deliver when it counts. Like when it counts, like you're not able to help. Even if they could have read the words that were on the wall, they didn't have the key to decipher the meaning of the message. Here's the thing. The ignorance of the wise men that they made to the king even more terrified. Like if I'm calling out these people, the people that I can count on, and they can't decipher this, then I'm in trouble. Made them more terrified. Their lords were confused. They couldn't offer any help. See, we see that political authority, wealth, power, human wisdom, it can do nothing to solve the problem. And once again, God had exposed the ignorance of the world and the ineffectiveness of man to discover and explain the mind and will of God. See, wisdom of the world is foolishness, and man cannot understand the things of God. That's what makes God, God. Worldly wisdom will contain a fail and disappoint, yet we continue to go back to worldly wisdom, thinking that we're going to get something different in the results. So let me ask you, Who are you looking to in this world for wisdom? Who has influence in your mind and in your heart? Verse 10, it says, The queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall. And the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change There is a man in your kingdom in whom his spirit of the holy gods in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king made him chief of the magicians, um, enchanters, Chaldeans and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So here we see it's uh, queen's probably translated to the queen mother, so it's probably most likely the king bee's mom. So we know how this is. Mom to the rescue. Right, it's interesting. Why didn't king bee, why didn't he think of calling Daniel? Was he too ignorant? Was he too prideful? Had he forgotten And here's the thing is, you know, mom walks in and says, I have a plan. It's okay. Mommy's here. I'll take care of everything. And here's what's interesting, too, is not only does she have um, a plan, but she seems overly optimistic. Like, just bring Daniel in. Everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be okay. We all know those people that are overly optimistic, right? There's the people that's like the world can be falling apart. The house is falling down. They're like, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's like, do you not see what's going on? How do I stay calm? There's a finger floating and writing something. I mean, how are you telling me to be calm? They're like, chill, it's okay. Stay calm. I mean, there's the people that are like the half glass full, and then there's the people like always full and overflowing. Okay, I think that this is is the situation. And interesting this is that we see Daniel's reputation. 
Where we see that Daniel obviously had impact, he had influence that was not forgotten. His reputation was one above reproach. He's not at this party hanging out and, and getting drunk. He's not hanging out doing things that are not honoring to God. We see that he was always available, patiently awaiting and available to serve God and serve others when needed. He did not give in to his temptations or to compromise his beliefs. See, Daniel's faithful conviction led to fruitful influence. It was his faithful conviction that led to fruitful influence. He had a great reputation and it opened doors for him to be used by God. Could the same be true of us? Then verse 13, it says, Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you. The spirit of the gods is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, and uh, have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you give interpretations and solve problems. Now, if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. So here's the point. Imagine this scene of this old man walking into this college party atmosphere. I would imagine there's probably people like snickering, like, (laughs) who's this old man? What is he going to do? What can he do that our magicians and and our, what what is he going to do that they can't do? Or probably even maybe some are thinking, okay, is he going to tell some good news or is he going to tell some bad news? And they're just sitting there anticipating, I want to know what he's going to drop. And what's interesting, too, is this, is King B welcomes Daniel by humbly reminding him where he came from. Then he kind of gives this backhanded compliment of, if you can interpret this. But we know he can because, not because he's Daniel, but because of God, who is Daniel. It's God speaking through him. So if culture-driven influence is marked by worldly wisdom, then conviction-driven influence is marked by godly wisdom. See, each time Daniel appears onto the scene, he reveals that there is a God in heaven who can do what the world's wise men cannot. See, wisdom from God is dependable. It's unexplainable, and often it's countercultural. See, Daniel's wisdom is clearly from God, the creator and sustainer of the world. See, it's interesting also that the king was worshiping false idols. He was even mocking God earlier that night. And who does he end up going to? He ends up going to a worshiper and follower of God in his time of desperation. So he's so desperate to know what the writing says, he turns to Daniel. And often in people's desperation, they'll cry out to God because nothing else works. God is waiting. He's been pursuing us. He's available to meet us where we are at and to rescue us. So why do we continue to seek the wisdom of the world first instead of God first? Is that something that you do, and why is that? See, worldly wisdom will fail us. We need wisdom from God. Verse 17 says, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. Okay, so he says, hey, you know what? Thanks for your gifts, but no thanks. I'm still going to do what you're asking me to do, though, because that's who I am, and I believe God wants to use me, and I want to be a mouthpiece for him. But what's interesting is this, is that Daniel probably doesn't, I'm just going to take an observation, he doesn't probably like King B. Okay, he doesn't want his reward, so he says, nope, don't want that. And then he leaves off the, oh, king, live forever. Now, he didn't greet him that way, and probably spoiler alert, though, is because Daniel knows something that the king doesn't know. He probably won't be around very long, okay? So here's the thing. He also says this. He says, when you remember with King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, hey, this interpretation, I'm going to give you dreams. He's like, I'm about to give you one, and I wish it was for your enemies and not for you. He does not say that for King B. 
And the interesting thing about the gifts is this. How many of us actually are pursuing and wanting the praise and approval of man? To have someone rich and powerful lift us up and praise us. How many of us want to be in a place of wealth, a place of, place of power and success and achievement? But Daniel couldn't be bought. He couldn't be bribed. And throwing worldly treasures at him was meaningless. See, Daniel's rejection of gifts also points to a couple other things. Not only is he not interested in wealth and power and earthly treasures that don't last or mean anything in God's economy, and God's economy doesn't matter. But they also don't bring true joy. They don't bring peace. They don't bring hope. And also, I believe this. I believe that Daniel is saying, you know what? Don't give me credit and don't reward me for something I can't do. Because what I'm about to do is only through God. So don't reward and give me something that I don't deserve. I'm going to literally tell you the truth, and I'm going to communicate God's message for you through me. See, Daniel gives God the credit, and he's not interested in getting the credit or earthly rewards as long as God is glorified. And is that true of us? To God be the glory. To God be the glory. Then verse 18, it says... O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, He was brought down from his kingly throne, and his glory was taken from him. Speaking of Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from among the children of mankind, and his mind was made like that of a beast, and his dwelling was with wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the most high God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. Though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are all your ways you have not honored So we're going to come back to this, some of those verses, but I want you to see that culture-driven influence is marked by watered-down truth. I believe that the world tells us just enough to truth to justify their actions or for us to believe them. And often we just trust and believe what people say without fact-checking and even more importantly, without looking through the lens of Scripture. See, so many of us, including myself, we fear of speaking truth thinking we may hurt feelings, be canceled, or be labeled anti-whatever. And I know there's been so many times in my life I can be passive when it comes to having conversations with people. Like, I don't want someone to think less of me, or I don't want to step on any toes, or what if I say something, you know what, that could be taken you know, the wrong way? So maybe it's just better that I don't say anything, or maybe I just, just kind of give them a little bit of the truth, not the whole truth. So, so often we tell people what they want to hear instead of what they need to hear. Say, we can actually do more damage when we water down the truth. I mean, I think about conversations with your kids, with family members, with friends, with people that are far from God, and because we water down the truth, it could actually do more damage, especially when it comes to Scripture. And here's the thing, when we share truth from God's Word, it's not my opinion, Right, But it's God's word that's true, it's relevant, it's alive and powerful. And when I'm sharing it, I'm going to do so humbly. I'm going to do so with respect and selfless motives. But I can also do it boldly and not ashamed. You know, I had a pastor of mine when I was growing up. They said something that stuck with me and I still share with people is that people believe what they want to believe so they can do what they want to do. Man, that is so true. Man, I'm going to believe what I want to believe so I can do what I want to do. <clears throat> Who are you to tell me what's true to me? Because 
I get to determine truth. And isn't that scary? But how often have I done that? Because the truth is, we will convince ourselves of what we want to be true instead of being influenced by biblical truth and conviction. The truth is, we can always find someone to support our beliefs and make us feel better. So if culture-driven influence is marked by watered-down truth, then conviction-driven influence is marked by biblical truth. See, Daniel does not sugarcoat anything when he's rebuking the king, but he's respectful and he's humble. But he's also not afraid to share the truth. As we often think of influence as self-gain, Daniel's more concerned with delivering the truth and the call for repentance and restoration rather than what he will personally gain. See, grace and truth has been a theme throughout Daniel, and Daniel's modeled this very well. And sometimes we share truth, catch this, but there's no compassion, humility, or grace involved, so people completely miss the truth. (laughs) But in the same way, there's other times that we share with so much grace and so much love that people completely miss the truth. And they leave more confused. So we need the balance of both, grace and truth. You know, at Parkway, one of our values is to love courageously. Why? Because authentic relationships are our priority. One of the questions that we ask to practice this is, what risks have you taken recently for others' good in your growth? We know it's a risk when we open our mouths and we share truth with people. We know it's a risk when we have to admit that we're wrong, when we have to ask for forgiveness. We know there's a risk when I have to tell somebody that, hey, you've hurt me. Or maybe there's a sin area or an area in your life that I just want to make you aware of that you might be missing. Like, we're taking a risk when we do that. But at the end of the day, it's for the good of that person, and it's for our growth as we step out in faith. So maybe for us, we're thinking, is there a conversation that God's wanted me to have? And not out of holier than thou, not that I have it all figured out, not that I'm better than you, but I'm going to step out in obedience and I'm going to trust that there's maybe something that you don't know that you don't know until I tell you. So I'm going to do so with grace and love and I'm going to be obedient to God's asking me to do. Not for my good, just because I want to share something, but for God's glory. Then we see culture-driven influence is marked also by pride and worship of false idols. See, Daniel reviews what God had taught King B's grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. Talked about how God humbled him by making him go insane for seven years. How he ate grass like a cow. No. And how at the end he looked toward heaven and acknowledged that God, the king of heaven, ultimately rules and is in control. And I told you I'm going to come back to this, so let's jump back to verse 22. This is so powerful. Speaking truth to Belshazzar, he says, And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart. You're filled with pride. Though you knew all this, like you shouldn't be surprised. You can't act ignorant. You can't say no one ever told me. You can't say I didn't know. But instead, you lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And then the vessels of his house have been brought in before you. And you and your lords and your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. Not only are you sinning, but you're bringing other people into your sin. Something that was set apart, that was holy, consecrated. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze and iron and wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. And those things, they don't see anything. They don't know anything. They're fake. But the God in whose hand is your breath, like God holds your very life in your next breath in his hand. He says, you have not honored him. And I read that, I admit that 
that hits me in a way that, man, how often have I done that? And so many times, God, I've put me before you. I've chased after something that is more, so much more, lower than you. See, King B knew that King Neb had been humbled by God, yet he ignored it because he was too prideful. King B knew that Neb had received all his authority from God and how God had humbled him and he had proved his sovereignty. But King B, he didn't say, I don't care. I didn't learn from that. I don't think it applies to me. I mean, how many times do we do the same thing? We ignore wisdom. We don't learn from others. We don't learn from history. We repeat the same mistakes. We think we're above the law. We're above authority. Rules don't apply to me. I'm untouchable. Even think we're above God. See, King B did not worship God as God. He did not credit God with all his power and success. He did not live his life to honor God. God was not first in his heart. Instead, he worshiped idols and lived to please himself, even mocking God. See, we all dishonor God, taking what God has set apart for his purposes and instead use them for our own purposes. So if culture-driven influence is marked by pride and worship of false idols, then conviction-driven influence is marked by humility and worship of the most high God. See, Scripture tells us that pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. God opposes the proud, but he shows favor to the humble. Scripture tells us that there's no God like our God. I mean, we just saying about that earlier. He has no equal. He has no rival. There's none. He and he alone is God. And we're to love him with our whole being and have no gods before him. See, God is a jealous God. He's a holy God, and we are set apart for him. So maybe you're not worshiping these carved out images in wood that topple over. Because, I mean, who would do that? But the truth is, is that maybe we're worshiping something that's less than God. I mean, we so often worship God's creation instead of worshiping the creator. So is God first in your heart? Do you have reverence for him and his holiness? What idols are in your life? Is it pleasure, power, success, money, maybe love for another person, possibly even love for yourself? Anything that has your affection more than God would be considered an idol. Then verse 24, it says, Then from his presence the hand was sent, and his writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed. Meaning, meaning, tekel and parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Meaning, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perish, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of God, gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. But that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. When we look at what happened, what's taken place, we look at this explanation of these words and regarding these words being interpreted, um, while they have meaning of measures of money, what Daniel did is that he interpreted the words to signify actually warning towards the king. The word mina meant numbered, and the repetition of the word indicated that God had determined and established the end of the kingdom and it would happen shortly. More than that, Tekel indicated that the king himself had been weighed by God and found wanting. He was short, had a deficit. Who would bring an end to the kingdom of the king of Babylon? Well, the answer is in the last word, Perez, 
which is the plural of parson, which we see here, which has carried a double meaning of divided and Persia. So Babylon would be divided between the Medes and the Persians, whose armies, where were they? Right outside the city. So culture-driven influence, we must know, is marked by false security. So you remember the king, he's throwing that party, right? And while everyone knows, everyone knows, even King B, that the Medes and the Persians are outside ready to attack, and he's throwing this party. Why is he throwing the party? I mean, maybe it's a confidence booster. You know, hey, we got this. We've, we've been in war before. We got this. Let's just do a little pre-celebration, right? Let's, let's, let's party it up. We're going to win this thing, but let's have a pre-party. Or maybe it was one of those things where it was like, hey, I'm just trying to distract. I'm trying to ignore about what's going on outside of these these gates. And how many times have we done the same thing? Whenever we're faced with something that we don't want to deal with, we try to numb ourselves. We try to distract ourselves and expecting that, hey, reality is just going to go away. When it's not. Or maybe he was just so prideful and ignorant. Once again, thinking like I'm untouchable. I mean, if you think about it, where they were is the city was 15 miles square and had walls 87 feet thick or so. Okay, the walls, not 87 feet high, thick. How are you going to penetrate that? Then there were 350 feet high, the walls, where were towers of an additional 100 to 450 feet higher. They had 100 massive bronze gates. They had food that could last over 20 years. Some of you still have that in your pantry. <laughs> Water from the Euphrates River was throwing, flowing through the middle of the city. I mean, what did they have the fear? They were taken care of. See, King B, though, had his security in all the wrong things, the things of the world, things that don't last and things that do not have power over the almighty, all-powerful, sovereign God. You see, when it doesn't matter how much wealth, possessions, power, protection you have, when God says your time's up, your time's up. See, false security says, I'm successful. I have a following. People like me. I have money. I have cool toys. I have power. And in the world's eyes, I've got it made. But confidence in ourselves or things of this world will always fall short compared to God's power and his plan. See, we may think it gives us comfort. It gives us peace. It gives us security, but it's all a facade. It's fake. It's short-lived, and it can be taken away at any moment. And once we die, you know what? You don't take it with you. It doesn't do you any good. It can't save you. It can't rescue you. See, Daniel actually experienced that. He already knew that. But when he was given those rewards from King B, even though he gave him bad news, he said, hey, you can still have these. He took them. And guess what? That night, the king was died. So it was short-lived. They're good for nothing. So if culture-driven influence is marked by false security, then we know conviction-driven influence is marked by security in God. See, true security is found in God. When all else will fail, God will not let us down. He is faithful. He's sovereign. He's trustworthy. He holds everything in his hands. Security in God realizes that I am not ultimately in control, but God, my creator, sustainer, he is in control. Therefore, when we are faced with compromising culture, we can stand firm in biblical conviction. Why? Because no matter what the risk, no matter what the cost, we can depend on God because he is faithful. And we've seen this throughout the book, like Daniel and friends. We can step out in obedience and faith no matter what the outcome. We can say what needs to be said. We can do what needs to be done and trust God with the outcome. You see, that night, by diverting the dam, damming up the river, they were able to now enter into the city that they thought was impenetrable, that they had all of their security in, made them untouchable. They were able to walk underneath the walls into the city gate. And the conquest of Babylon had been predicted by Isaiah and Jeremiah. You can read it in God's word. The prophecies are coming true, that Babylon had been God's chosen instrument to discipline his people of Israel. But the Babylonian army had carried it too far mistreating the Jews, and the conquest of Babylon was also God's punishment for what he had done to his temple. 
So that night, King B was killed, and all the prophecies came to fruition. Babylon had fallen, and the head of gold, right, that we see in the picture that Pastor Scott hit on earlier from the dream, the statue, we see that that head of gold that represented Babylon is now replaced by the arms and chest of silver, which represents the Medo-Persian Empire. According to historians, the date of this occurred on October 12th, 539 B.C. So you may be saying, hey, Ryan, like, good talk. And you might be saying, God has a message for me, but I don't see any floating fingers going on. And I will tell you that if I saw a floating finger writing on a wall, then I would obey it. Can I get that in writing? (laughs) Because I believe that so often, so many of us, we hear a message from God. Whether that's through his word, through his spirit, through his people. And we give him the Heisman. We give him the stiff arm. We say, no, we push it down. And what's interesting about this message is actually it was too late. And God doesn't want it to be too late. He wants you to respond now. He's been trying to pursue you. Warn you. The writing's on the wall. We cannot play ignorant. We know God's commands. We know his expectations. We're aware of the truth. Now I really believe it's an issue of, are we going to be prideful? Are we going to humble ourselves to honor and follow and obey him? See, if God was to write on the wall today a message for you, if he was to do that, what would it say? Not for the person next to you, not for the person that you wish was listening, But what would God say to you if he wrote a message on the wall? See, I believe that God has something for each of us. And will we allow pride, fear, or lies to get in the way? See, for those of us that are in Christ, we know that there's a watching world that's looking at our lives. And they're looking to see, are we influenced by biblical conviction or are we influenced by culture? And my prayer is that we would look differently than the world. As believers, though, don't be discouraged because God has not forgotten us. He is still on the throne and he's in control. And one day our king will return and he'll restore and redeem all that is broken. And we will spend eternity with him. So let us not fail to worship God as God, but humbly love and serve him above all. Will he be first in our heart? See, King B forgot the word of God, and the lessons from history. And it cost him his kingdom and his life, cost him everything. Let us not make that same mistake. And for those of you that don't know Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that salvation is found in Jesus Christ and him alone. It's not what you've done or what you can do, but it's in the finished work of the cross. See, in the book of Romans, Paul says, for there is none righteous, no, not one, No one does good, not even one, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Tells us that the wages of sin is death. What we deserve because of our sin is a physical and spiritual death. See, for all of us, our numbers are our days are numbered. We've been measured according to God's standard, and when we weigh ourselves on the divine scales of God's justice, we don't measure up. See, this is the writing on the wall for all of us. But there's good news. God is good. He's compassionate. He's forgiving. He's filled with grace and mercy. He wants us to repent and come back to him. And through Jesus, all of our insufficiency is covered by the blood of Christ on the cross. So you see this. None of us can ever be good enough to get to heaven. None of us will ever be good enough or can do anything to pay our debt. See, we can never be righteous enough to tip the scales in our favor. So what Jesus offered, he offered a substitution to take our place. See, it's not about being good enough. It's not about accumulating enough gold stars to be on the refrigerator in heaven. No, it's not what it's about. It's about nothing that we can do on our own. See, the Bible says it's by grace you have been saved. Getting something we don't deserve. Through faith, faith in Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. 
is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. If we're going to boast, we're going to boast about Jesus Christ. Not look what I've done, but look what he's done. See, Jesus lived a perfect life without sin, and then he died a death. We were, supposed to die, we were supposed to die, paying for the penalty of our sins. So when you receive Jesus onto your side of the scales, check this out. God puts the righteousness of Christ on you, and on the other side, God takes away the sin because that debt is paid for by Jesus So there's nothing left on that side of the scale. That means that when you're weighed on the scale of God's justice, if you are in Jesus Christ, you are no longer coming up short. There's no longer a deficit. Nothing could ever tip the scales of justice against you because on your side is the eternal righteousness of Jesus Christ. So do you believe that? Are you living that? What message does God have for you today? How are you going to respond? Heavenly Father, we love you. We need you. You and you alone are worthy of our praise. We thank you for your word and that it's true. We thank you for your spirit that convicts and for those that have trusted Christ as our Savior that lives within us. We want to be a people that when people see us, that we're not influenced by the culture. We're influenced by you and your word to honor and to glorify you, would we humbly submit to you? If there's anybody that we know that needs to hear the good news of Jesus, would we boldly share that with them? If there's anyone that's listening that has not entered from darkness to light, would today be the day that they surrender to you and follow you and experience true, abundant life? Heavenly Father, our prayer is that you and you alone would be first in our heart. Would that be evident to you? Would we bring glory and honor, not to our names, but to your name? Make that true in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.